is the standard that's used in the Equal Access to Justice Act. So there is, we have case law going back to 1980, which is well established, and it has not really um, eliminated the, the uh, legitimate lawsuits in, in that regard. So I think we've got a long history of, uh, of this is not a new standard. It's just a, you're changing the standard to, to fit something that works very well. Uh, this, this time, Mr. Marino is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman. First of all, I would like to answer uh, uh, five command letters asked for unanimous consent that these documents be entered into the record. Without objection? And I will, I will say what they are. The first letter is from Isa May. I, know, I do not know if I'm pronouncing this right, so I'll spell it. ISA, capital M-A-I, dated June 16, 2013, from uh, doing business out of Delaware. The next one is Farney, F-A-R-N-E-Y, Daniels, L-L-P, dated August 1st, 2012, out of Texas. Uh, the third demand letter is Lerner, David, Littenberg, uh, Krumholtz, and Netlick, uh, dated July 1st, 2013, and I believe they're out of New Jersey. Uh, the next letter is Demaris, uh, D-E-S-M-A-R-A-I-S-L-L-P, it's uh, dated June 2nd, 2011, and uh, they're from New York, and the last is Innovation Wireless Solutions, LLC, uh, from Texas, dated April 10th, 2013. Uh, these letters are typical letters. They fail to state a claim by the plaintiff. Uh, it's the features of the alleged abuse by defendant uh, are absent, and we don't know who's suing. Thank you, and those are made a part of the record. Even one of the letters has a little diagram, and uh, the diagram says if your main computer is dealing with a fax machine, sending information to a fax to another computer or to a printer, there's a violation. Well, apparently I have some problems in my house because my children's computers and mine and my wife's are all linked together. We go to the fax machine, we go to the printer, and we go to the internet and we send each other emails. Uh, e emails. So this is, this is how ridiculous uh, uh, these letters are, particularly to small businesses in my district who just are scared to death when they get something like this because uh, they do not know what's going on. Uh, so the, the, this legislation is, uh, is clearly, clearly needed. Uh, Mr. Kapos, could you please, uh, I may have misunderstood, and I know a couple of my colleagues have stated that uh, there's not uh, an abuse, the, 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 it wasn't the GEO or one of the offices said the cases have an increase, it doesn't appear to, appear to be a, an abuse of litigation. But you're certainly not saying that that is the standard because there's no increase or because there doesn't appear to be a great deal of abuse in the legal system that we should not look at penalizing somehow the plaintiffs uh, in these cases for sending demand letters, among other things just like this. Well, there clearly is a problem with abuse of litigation. We're but, but we're not basing it on the number of uh, cases. You're not basing it on the number of cases or the increased uh, litigation in the courts, are you? I'm basing that view on not on the number of cases, okay. but on the um, exemplars of abuse like the ones that you're talking about. Sure. Good. Thank you. Uh, I do agree with you. I think the, uh, uh, we need to fund the U.S. PTO. Uh, it, it, it's in drastic need of funding, and I think uh, three areas will really make a difference uh, in this. Uh, funding uh, PTO, because enough people to look at the patents coming in can tell whether they're, you know, they're legitimate and, and they're following the rules that are prescribed. Number two is making sure the courts get serious about fees and sanctions. And as a prosecutor for 18 years, I, I give a great deal of, uh, I was a U.S. attorney in the Middle District, the judges were excellent there. Uh, but uh, I hope that uh, courts are really gonna take a serious look at this as far as uh, awarding uh, fees and applying sanctions. And I would like to ask anyone who wants to respond to this, uh, this is a, based on what Mr. Gupta stated, if that plaintiff knew about that license, what, is there anyone on the panel that says that this is not a fraud against the court by omitting that information? 
And why should criminal charges not be filed against somebody for doing this? Uh, no response, so I'm guessing you agree with me on this. Uh, Mr. Kramer, I see you, would, you wanna make a statement here? Uh, thank you, uh, Congressman. Certainly that is uh, egregious behavior. Courts typically have already the ability to sanction that type of behavior, and, and I agree in that situation. Uh, they should use that power. And, and I find the courts, both from when I worked in the state court and the federal court, the courts are very reluctant to award fees and uh, to uh, enforce penalties and sanctions. Uh, I'm hoping that we get the court's attention. Uh, I really don't want to get into a position where Congress, uh, to a great deal, is telling the court what to do on discretionary matters. But if your plaintiff knew and that could be shown. Uh, I think it's fraud on the court, and I think not only should there be severe fees and sanctions, but I think there should be criminal charges filed as well. Uh, Mr. Gupta? And if I might add to that, I agree with you, Congressman, and if, as Judge, Chief Judge Rader wrote in the op-ed piece that he authored in the New York Times, he, he acknowledged that there is a problem where district courts are not awarding fees uh, and shifting costs in this regard. And, and I think there's also an acknowledgement that uh, the Federal Circuit feels that, 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 that the judges don't act uniformly or the courts don't in, in doing so. If I were a U.S. attorney, I'd be all over this like white on snow. Well, one of the difficulties with most patent litigation is the subject matter is complicated, the patent law is complicated. There's a certain fog of patent litigation that engulfs the courts, and it's to the advantage of someone to have vague pleadings and broad discovery requests, et cetera, yeah. that uh, even if they're meritless, it's in the fog, it's hard to see the lack of merit sometimes on the part of the court. And that to me is why these maybe special remedies are needed for this special kind of litigation. And, and, and I'm gonna yield back with this closing. It's, it's not my idea, but my colleagues saw it. I noticed the, the three tech guys are reading from paper and the pharmaceutical guys reading from the pad. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Moreno. And actually, he did not exceed his, his time because uh, he had a uh, unanimous consent request, which doesn't count on his time. Uh, the gentle lady from uh, California, Ms. Ms. Hughes, recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'd li like to ask Mr. Gupta a question about end users. I'm, I'm very concerned about the effect of frivolous suits that are filed against the end users of products. These customers of, of everyday technologies are oftentimes victims of demand letters and patent infringement lawsuits. And I know from example in my local area in Southern California about this because the local credit unions were uh, the subject of a, of a lawsuit from the uh, patent assertion entities uh, just because they had features on their websites that had to do with online banking features. And, uh, you know, some of them are very, very small credit unions, but they, they were uh, sued as a group. And ultimately, they had to make a decision between reducing staff or proceeding with a lawsuit. Finally, they just gave up and they settled with the patent trolls. I, I just think this is outrageous, and I think that we need to find some way of relieving our end users. So that's why I'm so pleased to see that Chairman Goodlatte included a provision that would allow customer suits to be stayed while a manufacturer intervenes on their behalf uh, because the manufacturer has the ability to defend a patent infringement lawsuit given that it has prior art and knowledge of how the technology truly works. So Mr. Gupta, I know your, your company has a great deal of experience in dealing with these cases. Can you tell us more about the nature of these lawsuits and walk us through how your legal team makes the decision to intervene in an end user suit, what factors do you consider and do you ask that the end user consent to being bound by the outcome of the case? Uh, thanks for that question, Congresswoman. We, um, we find ourselves um, as being the covered manufacturer at times and we also find ourselves as being the covered customer at times. So there are instances where we buy a chip or a component that then get, you know, is used to develop a, a computer um, system, and the infringement accusations are really directed to the chip, but we're the ones that are sued. 
in those instances, we look to the chip manufacturer to intervene and, and defend the litigation, and we believe that that's a, uh, a more productive way to go about it. And there are times that when we are suppliers and, uh, of, of technology and, and times our customers get notices, um, in, in, in addition to the fact that we've been sued, and, and we have to, at that point in time, intervene and, and, and attempt to resolve the case. The, the, um, what's incentivizing this sort of behavior is that um, PAEs have figured out that if you go further and further downstream, you are potentially able to target a, a customer or a, or a party that is least able to defend the action and, and probably has a larger revenue base related you know, relative to the component or the product that's accused. I, I, I give the example often of a, a patentee that might have a patent on a, on a wiper blade. Why would you sue the wiper blade manufacturer for a $10 part when you can sue an automaker for shipping a car that sh sells for $30,000 with a wiper, and why stop there? Why not go after a auto rental agency and attempt to collect certain portion of their rental fees because they rent out cars that have wipers? Now, in those circumstances, it makes utmost sense, and this bill provides um, a mechanism for it, where the auto rental company or the auto manufacturer would agree to a stay with the manufacturer of the wiper blade and let the wiper blade manufacturer take it up with the, with the patentee. There might be instances where if indeed it is the auto uh, rental company that says, I need a custom part designed for my wipers, and they customize the wiper, or they take it and put, put a special coating on it, they trim it in a different way that's unique to their use, and the patent goes to that unique aspect, then the suit may be rightfully brought against that party that made those modifications that brought it to within the claims of the patent. But by and large, the abusive behavior tends to be where there are discrete parts where the end user is really not in any way, shape, or form modifying the part that's accused of infringement, but they're the ones that are sued. Thank you for that. And um, I'd like to uh, enter into the record now a letter that was sent to the committee on Monday in support of expanding the covered business method program. It was signed not only by high tech groups, but other industries that are badly in need of relief, such as grocers, chain restaurants, and retailers. Uh, the money was taken that was taken from them impacts thousands of constituents. So I asked to enter this letter into the record, uh, Mr. Uh, Chair. Without objection. Uh, Mr. Kramer, if I may uh, ask, um, uh, about these covered business methods, you've, you've um, uh, fought back against these suits for many years now. Uh, can you tell ab ab us about any past cases in which an expanded CBM program would have been helpful? Thank you for that question, Congresswoman. Uh, unfortunately, off the top of my head, I don't have a, uh, a great fact situation uh, to share with you, but uh, I can say that uh, there we have been participants in a uh, pending CBM uh, at this point in time. So and we think it's a, a useful uh, proceeding. It is uh, helpful to have uh, uh, low cost alternatives to litigation. Uh, and uh, because of that, uh, you know, we certainly uh, support that, that program. Thank you, I yield back. Thank you. Uh, just to clarify, you know, the, the business methods already are reviewed. We're including patents. Is, is that, is that y'all are your understanding? You know, in the, in the covered business method, it, it includes patents. We already include business methods. In the original bill that, Mr. that we passed, Chairman. I'm not, I'm not sure I understand the question. Could you restate it? We keep talking about uh, a dip, there's a difference in business methods and patents. And we already have statutory language that's already covering business methods. So what we're talking about here is patents. Is that in, correct? In, in the American Vents Act, there was a special uh, section. For financial scheme, services. Right, that yes. covered uh, business method patents. It's the Patent Office, in fact, has given that term quite a broad interpretation. It's, I think, as broad as the statute would allow. And it goes on for a period of eight years. So if this committee did nothing on that issue, uh, that procedure would continue in place for years to come. Sure, okay. 
Mr. Farenho. Uh, thank you very much, and I'm really glad we're having this uh, hearing today. As patent reform is an important uh, issue, I'm kind of a tech guy, so I enjoy it. Uh, but you know, there's a problem when you've got, uh, you know, I can't get Wi Fi at my local Whataburger, and the prices in my grocery store are coming up because they're getting uh, tagged by uh, frivolous lawsuits. Uh, so I, I, I kind of want to uh, touch on some of the stuff that the gentlelady from California. Uh, talked about because I'm specifically interested in end users as well. And Mr. Gupta, you said uh, uh, that uh, you don't settle uh, unmeritorious suits because it would be tantamount to giving in uh, to extortion. And I understand as a player in the uh, uh, intellectual property game that uh, I applaud that. But, you know, Whataburger, for instance, which, you know, Texas based burger company, better than In N Out Burgers. Um, but <laughs> They make, ha they make hamburgers. They don't play in the uh, intellectual property game, and uh, they don't have the expertise in it. Uh, they get a, a demand letter, or you know, you take it down uh, even lower to a mom and pop uh, business, and you get these demand letters uh, listing all the uh, all the demands, all the claims, all the potential damage, and then uh, hitting you with three or four paragraphs on uh, how you can't how to, how to avoid a spoilation claim, and you got it. You can't. You, know, you got to replace the hard drives and all your computers to uh, preserve evidence. I mean, does this go far enough uh, to protect end users in, in what we're doing, do you think? I think there are several provisions in the bill, and, and, and what you touched on um, is really um, an, uh, a collection of abusive practices um, that lead to that sort of um, messy outcome for, for those um, defendants. And, and I think there are several provisions in the bill that would uh, address very specific um, aspects of abusive procedural uses that would ultimately curtail those sort of behavior. But, you know, I I in, in the example of the burger manufacturer, if indeed it was something that they felt they needed to take a stand on, like Martha Stewart did, um, if they knew that ultimately if they did take it to trial and they prevailed, that there would be some uh, accountability on the part of the plaintiff for having harassed these folks in the first place, that there would be some sort of um, some sort of remedy at the end of the day to so, shift the burden. So, Mr. Kappas, I mean, you talked about not wanting to reach down to the mom and pops. I think that was in, in answer to one of your questions. I mean, it, it seems like this stuff naturally rolls downhill once the patent trolls have uh, uh, finished uh, shaking down the big businesses and they move down to the They've already moved down to the Whataburgers. I'd call them a medium-sized business. Uh, you know, when do they move down to, uh, you know, the 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 one person has a one retail store, the boutique, or when do they uh, move into my house and say, oh my, uh, you got a you got a Wi-Fi router in your house and you got a cell phone. That'll be uh, 50 bucks licensing fee, or we're going to sue you for 10,000. Yeah. So I, I think there are are. First of all, that is happening already, and that's why you've seen in, in some states um, uh, some state action being taken. Um, but there are a number of issues with this provision that I think for the water burgers of the world in Texas um, are, are going to make the provision probably not helpful um, in its current uh, uh, manifestation. The, the top one on my list is that um, there's a requirement for the um, covered end user or retailer in this case to uh, agree to be bound by the judgment. The problem with that is that parties are never in exactly the same position. They're in different positions. They were put on notice at different times. So what would you propose to fix that? There needs to be work done um, on the statute in order to ensure that uh, uh, that, that parties. But you could would, would would say a provision to uh, stay it, then an option to be uh, bound by it, and then a tolling of the statute of limitations during uh, that time. Would that be a workable solution? Or I mean, I, I'm trying to figure out how to fix this so so it solves those problems. Yeah, I'm not sure if I understand that, but but certainly uh, I think the issue is resolvable for so that the statute benefits the retailers uh, without being overextended. All right, then does anybody else on the panel want to comment on uh, ways we could improve that? And I'm specifically concerned about uh, end user protection. Does anybody else want to add anything? I don't want to leave the opportunity. Go ahead. 
I would say one other thing. There's an issue also there with um, uh, the, the commonality of interest that's needed in order to trigger the provision. The way it's worded right now, I think we're going to see a lot of um, reordering of commercial relationships with parties, you know, like the EMCs of the world when they're when their customers are in asking for to change indemnity provisions, that's going to create one set of situations because customers are going to want to get indemnities to get under this new provision and be able to stay litigation. And then EMC, when it's in the position of being a customer, is going to want to change indemnity language. And I'm not sure Congress meant to reorder commercial relationships, so that needs to be taken into account too. All right. I see I'm out of time, but I think Mr. Kramer wants to answer if the chair will indulge me. It's been a lot of minutes. Uh, yes, you can answer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for the question, Mr. Barron, uh, Congressman. Um, yeah, you know, I, I, I steadfastly believe that that uh, those who manufacture should stand behind their technology. Right? I know we do. We expect our partners to to do that. Uh, so I, I I think the the provisions uh, in the, the the act regarding end user. Uh, stays, I think, are a great start, and certainly happy uh, to have my staff get in touch with your staff and work on appropriate language to, to make sure everybody is uh, satisfied. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Deutsch, are you next, or Mr. 